is Mutavakin. He'll be coming up soon. And uh, I'm going to watch a little bit of uh, Lou playing and a little bio, and then we'll come back live. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. yeah. Oops, we're getting some wicked echo here. Uh, let's hope that goes away. We'll see what happens. I want to welcome my friend Lou Tabakins, the Jazz Video Guy Live. How are you, Lou? Hey, Brett. How you doing, man? How you dealing? Everything cool? Well, everything's cool so far. Lou is sequestered with his lovely wife, Toshiko, in New York City. Please send our love uh, to Toshiko. I know that she's a big baseball fan, and uh, there's no baseball. No, there's nothing. No, there's. <laughs> no. You're right. So so funny. Uh, yesterday it was Memorial Day. We expected to be able to turn on a tube and watch something, but not happening. That's life. Well, well, uh, I think we're picking up some echo here. Lou, uh, hold on one second. I'm going to put some headphones on. That might help. Okay. We'll see what that does. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, let's go back to the beginning. How did you happen to uh, play the tenor saxophone, and how did you happen to be a jazz musician, though? Boy, that's a rough one. I think we covered that the last interview. It was like two hours long, so uh, I guess I'll be repeating myself. I started when I was 15. I started to play the saxophone when I was 15. Before that, I played a little flute, a little bit of clarinet, and uh, for some reason, I wanted to play the tenor. And uh, anyway, Philadelphia, I grew up with, almost grew up in Philadelphia. And Al Cohen was a big cult hero. Anyway, you okay? Yeah, I'm good. And anyway, so. Uh, I checked him out and I got a tenor and I got a Con 10M tenor with a four hard rubber Brillhart mouthpiece and a number two symmetric cut reed. And in about four hours, I got a pretty decent sound. In the immortal words of Richard Young, I put the horn in my mouth and I knew the bitch was mine something like that. So I knew I was cool. I had an, I had an affinity towards the, that instrument. So I could always, I could always get a sound. And nothing else, but I could get a sound. And one thing led to another, and a lot of trial and error, a lot of uh, 
going through a lot of different approaches, and here I am, 80 years old, still trying to get it right. Well, I'm 70 years old, and I'm still trying to get it right as well. Uh, you mentioned Al Cohn. Uh, when I talk to many saxophone players who are uh, in your generation, which is a generation above me, the, the name that immediately comes out is Coleman Hawkins. Was Coleman Hawkins at all an influence on you? Coleman oh, Hawkins, well, see, that came later. <clears throat> you have to start somewhere. And I started there, and uh, I actually uh, morphed into a Coltrane clone. And <laughs> I, was do I was pretty good, actually. Sonically, I, I sounded like him. And then I realized that was kind of a, something wrong with that picture. You know, uh, what am I doing trying to sound like someone else? to get on the bandstand and become a method actor. Uh, so I I asked a, a guy, a trombone player, his name was Leo Fogel, who was a bit older and he had a record collection. And I went over to his place and he played me all the great tenor players who I never really heard. I, I, I didn't come from a musical family. I didn't listen to jazz records as a kid or anything else. Anyway, he played me Lester. Well, how, I mean, Lester, I couldn't believe how great that was. Uh, got to Don Bias. I never heard the saxophone played that well. I mean, it was amazing. Uh, ben Webster, another th most beautiful sound. I played all these guys, and he got to Hawkins, and Hawkins was too difficult for me. Hawkins is very complicated, many levels. Uh, so I kind of like couldn't quite <laughs> quite get it, but years later, a little light bulb went off, and there was Hawkins was the key. Hawkins is, was a source, so to speak. So I, you know, I really appreciate and and I, you know, I I, I don't know how to describe it. I, I let him come into my soul, basically. So there's a there's. Hawkins in there. I, I, when I listen to all these players, I and I try to absorb a lot of the essence of most of them. I wasn't into so much transcription, but absorbing the essential feeling and sound. And finally, I realized that the secret, secret, the way you finally find your identity is to put all the influence together and mix them up, and and all of a sudden. By the time you're 40, you have uh, you have your own identity. And then when I I used to listen to Sonny Rollins a lot live, which uh, many people didn't have the opportunity to do in certain in the great periods. And then I realized oh, that's how that's what Sonny did. I, I could hear Hawkins. I could hear I could hear uh, Chew Berry. I could hear Lester. I could hear all these elements. And I said, well, that's, that reinforced my idea that by listening to a lot of players and you can eventually find your voice through them in a way. It's like Pepper Adams had a great line. He used to say, if you copy one or two guys, it's plagiarism. If you copy a lot of people, it's called research. So research <laughs> is the answer. And uh, I was just talking to a young lady the other day. Uh, plays really good. Nicole Glover, I don't know if you know her. No. She up on 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 uh, Facebook and I was quite impressed and I, I I hooked up a communication and she's she's involved in trying to check out, you know, the tradition. She she's totally into Hawkins now. And so Hawkins is the guy basically. I mean Hawkins Hawkins, the father of jazz saxophone, I keep on saying that he's the father of free jazz in a way, uh, solo, solo, unaccompanied a cappella playing. He was maybe in a way the father of bebop. I think he was a great supporter of, of a lot of the guys. He had Monk played in his band for a while. So anyway, he he was a giant on so many levels, and unfortunately. Most most of the younger, not even just the younger players, they don't really uh, have much um, 
influence or not influence, they don't have much interest. Seems that sax, tenor saxophone started with Coltrane and him. Uh, so they're missing out on a lot, I think. So I think, again, Hawkins is Hawkins is the source. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, the tenor saxophone uh, has gone through a process, and uh, you hear that uh, in musicians who have studied Ben Webster and Coleman Hawkins and Lester Young and Dexter Gordon and can draw from uh, a number of those things. You mentioned uh, that you were at one point a Coltrane clone. Why do you think so many tenor players wanted to emulate Coltrane? There was a certain thing in his playing, a certain spiritualism, and it kind of gets you. Like he could play the most ordinary phrase, and it would sound like something, or something different, or, or had so much impact. And in a way, he he was kind of not easy, but it was easier. Put it, I think it's easier to uh, to put it. <laughs> I'm trying to come up with the right words. Uh, steal from Coltrane, and this is steal from Hawkins. I think Hawkins is more complicated. But like Sonny Rollins is, uh, was kind of seen to be free of systems. He was he just like was a stream of consciousness kind of guy. Uh, Coltrane worked worked on stuff, and so you could kind of figure out uh, how a lot of it went. And there was something magical about the way he played, and it was easy. To get caught into that, you know, incredible intensity and spiritualism, and, and I, I was, I was sound sonically, I was pretty good at it. And then I began to think, what am I doing? I mean, I, and I kept on hearing these white guys try to sound like Train, and they sound really terrible to me. And I said, well, maybe I'm just as bad as them. So, time to find your own shit. You know, it's like. Um, Speaking of, uh, you remind me of uh, something. I, I, John Faddis asked me to do this gig, a Ralph Ellison posthumous book release party in Harlem, and he just he wanted to do black, brown, and beige, the whole the whole piece, and, and I was I would I had the part of of Ben Webster, and. A lot of the stuff was written out, supposedly, by Duke, but I think it was kind of half and half. And, but anyway, I tried so hard to get into the spirit of Ben Webster, and I, I, I tried so hard, and I, I, at least I thought I did pretty good. I don't know what anybody else thought, but I thought I was totally in 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 the moment. And after the performance, it took me a month to get out of that, get out of that dark. Ben Webster world, you know, there's a certain tragic, Tosco calls a tragic beauty, and unlike the other, you know, players of his generation, he had a, a dark character, and it's, it's so emotionally draining, and like I couldn't, I couldn't, I'm mean, there even videos of him crying when he was playing. I mean, it, it, it was an amazing experience. I felt like a method actor that couldn't get out of his part. So I learned my lesson. Don't do that. Don't do that anymore. I mean, I, I've done like little tributes and just a couple people. I've done some Zoot Sims and Hawkins, which is cool. You know, you just make a minor little uh, emphasis on some of the stuff that they did. But uh, the world is the same. The world is not. The world is not different like the Ben Webster world. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else has had that experience. I don't know. I've never talked to any saxophone players that had that experience, but it was interesting. Yeah. Now, as we sit here talking today on May 26, this is the anniversary of uh, the birth of Miles Davis. And it leads to a question. We've talked about the influence of uh, different tenor sax players. Any other instrumentalists on any other instruments or vocalists that may have an influence in your playing? Well, I don't know. Uh, obviously, probably. But, uh, I mean, as far as always, always like, you know, Billie Holiday could get to, you know, on 
certain level, and that was, but that was always kind of related to Prez. And, uh, you know, of course, every, everything that Louis Armstrong played, or, or Clark Terry was an influence on me, because I, uh, I, you know, I played with him a fair amount, and he, he was important. He doesn't even know it. He, I mean, I don't think he knew it. <laughs> uh, I, well, I, I, Jude Sims kind of got me in, in Clark Terry All Star Band, and what Jude was supposed to do it, and Jude really didn't want to do it. He kept on sending me into rehearsals, and eventually, Phil Woods said, "Well." I don't think Zoo wants to do this. You should probably do what you're doing in rehearsal. So anyway, I'm playing. I'm the only non-all-star in this band. I think it was around 1966 or seven. And uh, I'm playing in this band. And Clark is, you know, playing. He sounds great. He, no matter what he plays, the chart didn't have to be that great, but he always sounded amazing. And I get up to play, and I sound stupid, you know. I'm playing and I don't know what I'm trying to play. Uh, you know, I've been through a lot of things, but I I couldn't, I guess it was the insecurity of not, you know, like I shouldn't have been there, maybe. But then I, I started to think about it. I said, well, wait a minute. So I started to listen to Clark playing. And I said, let me, let me grow out of Clark. Let me see if I can grow out of his spirit or you know, his feeling. And I, I tried, I kind of cooled me out. And all of a sudden I felt like, well, wait a minute, I'm okay. I, I have my own shit, but Clark is giving me this certain uh, something that I needed to to uh, cool me out and put me in the right, in, in the right sphere, so to speak. So Clark was important, you know, in, 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 in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Clark was a remarkable man, not only an incredible trumpet player, but as a human being and a fantastic inspiration, you know, to many of us. Um, I want to welcome, uh, we've got viewers from all over the world today, from France, from Spain, from Brazil, and a viewer whose name is Catella12 uh, points out that uh, the opener uh, that we listened to and saw was something from uh, Toshiko's, uh, I believe Toshiko calls it Chasing After Love. And she has a question, this viewer. She said that initially it was the Toshiko Akiyoshu Lu Tobacken Big Band, then it became the Toshiko Akiyoshu Big Band featuring Lu Tobacken. What is the, what is, how did that evolve? What is the official name of the band? That's easy. Well, it was my idea to change it. Because for a couple of reasons. First of all, when we first started the band, I was basically contractor and you know main soloist, obviously. And but I never wrote any of the music. Uh, I wrote a couple of tunes, whatever, but nothing that serious. And I would be given more credit than I deserve. Put it that way. If they're you know they're kind of like well, a Japanese woman, what you know, she couldn't do all this. And I. I I must have had something to do with it, which was not true. So I wanted to basically set the record straight in a way, and we moved to New York, reorganized the band, and and in those it was the beginning of the orchestra terminology. You know, people started to use the orchestra, which doesn't make sense, but that's the way it was. Orchestra should have strings, I think. But anyway, it became the Toshikawa Jazz Orchestra featuring me, which is in a way it should have been in the beginning. But that so it's basically it was a way of setting the record straight and uh, getting rid of any possible confusion about who did what. Well, there's some great playing in that orchestra and uh, some great writing and arranging as well. I wanted to jump over here to a video that showcases another side of Lou Tobacken, and that's his flute playing. left side or the right side.
Uh, Gary Simoleon, our, our friend, uh, baritone saxophonist, uh, believes that you have one of the most beautiful flute sounds in all of music. And another one of our viewers, uh, Steve Provencher, uh, pointed out that he felt your, that flute playing was kind of like a shagahachi playing, uh, that Japanese flute. Are you at all influenced by uh, Japanese music and the flute? Well, basically, yeah, it started with uh, Tosco wrote our first recording. She wrote a piece called Kogan, and it was a story about uh, uh, Lieutenant Onada, who was a young guy who was a reconnaissance guy, and uh, the Japanese is like during the Second World War. They sent they, they sent him to. Uh, check out the Philippines. So when the Japanese were triumphant and they come in, they would know what's going on. So he's, he's there and he's there and he doesn't know. He's there for 30 years. He doesn't know that the war was over. He's still doing his gig. He's trying to survive. There were a couple others, but he was the lone survivor. And anyway, the story finally, uh, it's a long story, but he finally made it. He was taken back to Japan, and Tosco was touched by his story. And she wrote a piece called Kogan, which means like kind of like one man army, four law one force, whatever. So she wrote this piece, and there's a flute solo. And I said, Tosco, I don't, I don't want to play a little bebop flute solo. I mean, it seems like it seems like it wouldn't seem appropriate. So. I, I I checked out some shakuhachi music, and that was my first attempt at trying to get develop some kind of Japanese um, essence, which that's the correct word. Um, so that was so I started getting a little more interested in, in, in it, and the more I delved into that music, and I had an affinity towards that. That it's kind of a Kind of like a Zen approach, which I, I've actually done Zen Zen performances. But anyway, I, I, for certain music, I really I really can get into that. Uh, almost like the Ben Webster thing, but I could get out of it. So I can I can kind of I kind of hypnotize myself and uh, get into the not if I'm really if the situation is right, I can get into the total non-thinking reality. And just become one with, with uh, my surroundings. And I, I like the shock, shock, sound of shakuhachi. I, I have one, but I don't play it because it, it screws up my flute chops. So I, I don't deal with it. But yeah, I, I had some influence. But you know, that become an important part of my playing. But it's not the only part. I have other. In, in the very beginning, I was more of a French impressionistic kind of guy. One of my solos are more like in that area. So now I, you know, I, again, I just according. I, I'm a, I, when I play the flute, I, I think totally narratively. So I'm always telling a story, no matter, you know, whatever it is. So it'll be slight differences. Um, so that's that's a little bit of the insights. So when the first time the band came to Japan, I think it was '76. And uh, I was a little bit apprehensive. I said, maybe these people will think I'm jive, you know, playing kind of uh, in the Japanese aesthetic. And I don't know what I'm doing, basically. And uh, so I played my long solo, and people really appreciated it. And they said, Luke Tobacco has a Japanese soul. So I felt encouraged. And till this day, I. I I utilize that, and I try to get into that certain space. And I've also lately, in the last few years, I've also done some no and OH performances in Japan, which are very interesting for me. It's another story. We could do an hour on that. But yeah. That's that's about a little synopsis. Well, here, hearing you play the flute uh, brings up a question um, in terms of breathing techniques. Uh, an armature, like actually, a two-part question. One is, uh, when you go from the saxophone to the flute, how might that affect your armature? 
And the second thing is, uh, what about breathing exercises? Do you do anything like that? Well, you, you, you really hit on the uh, great dilemma, uh, like switching from saxophone, especially the way I play saxophone. I, I don't play, I play pretty heavy equipment. And so when I switch to the flute, it takes a minute, you know. Sometimes I cheat if I'm playing a gig and I'll like, uh, I'll talk a little bit before I play the flute to let the blood come back to my chops. So now there's a, Put it this way, the flute really helps the saxophone because you're dealing with, you hit the nail on the head, you deal with breathing. Flute is all about breathing because there's no reed or mouthpiece, you know, you put pressure on or, or find a way to get around it. But I do some breathing exercises in the morning. I kind of quasi uh, yoga breathing thing. And, you know, breathing is... And that's the thing that, you know, as you get older, you're really concerned about that. You can't take it for granted. You have to really make sure that uh, breathing uh, is, is together. So I, I've been helping this girl, uh, alto, Japanese alto player, Erna Teraku, Terakuba. You know her? I don't. Well, she, she bebops like mad, alto player. <laughs> and she wanted to learn how to play the flute, so I gave her a lesson, and I, tr I tried to talk to her about, I don't know if it'll, it'll do any good, or, but if you're going to play the flute, just don't play it like, uh, play the same shit you play on the saxophone, otherwise it's, why do it, why even bother with it? Uh, if you're going to play the flute, use it as another way to express different ideas, different feelings, because the sound of the flute is so different than the saxophone, so... Uh, I think that's that kind of sums up a, how I think about the instrument. So, in turn, we have a question from a viewer, Michael Schuster. I'm going to rephrase it. So, when you uh, play the flute, you approach improvisation in a different way than you do on the saxophone. Exactly. That's it. You say you're you're pretty smart, Brett. Yeah, basically, I, I do. I, I I make a point. Put it this way. I kind of make a point of it. Like what I just, because the flute has a, it's another world. It's got a different history and a different uh, dynamic reality and different quality. And wh why should I just play like little, replicate what I played on the saxophone? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to go through all the effort to put, to, to deal with playing the flute, to just play some little, you know, cutesy little stuff, you know, people might like it, but flute can be powerful. It can, it can express a lot on the flute. And uh, so it's two different, two different worlds, a schizophrenic reality. Uh, Roger Rosenberg, who was our guest last week, uh, wanted to comment that he loves your solo on Duke Pearson's New Girl. Uh, that's one of those bands that too many people know about. Say, can you say a few words about, uh, maybe this is when you first came to New York, the Duke Pearson Big Band? Yeah, that was, uh, uh, I was very fortunate. I, I don't know why this happened to me, but I came to New York and first night in New York, I I went to this place and sat in and <laughs> imposed myself on people. And, uh, and one thing leads to another, and I wound up in a lot of bands. I never played in big bands in my life, you know, basically in, I'm, I'm from Philadelphia. There was not much to do with big bands in New York. Any guy, young players, always played in big bands. There were a lot of them. But anyway, uh, um, Duke, I started playing Duke Pearson's band, and it was it was like a family. It was a beautiful, beautiful kind of a experience. Uh, and the music session was so great. It was Mickey Roker and Bob. Bob Cranshaw. So it was an amazing rhythm section. And Duke's music was, Duke was, you know, he was a very sensitive guy and very special individual. And he treated me with a lot of respect, which I probably didn't deserve. But anyway, uh, I did. I had my feature on the first big band was with uh, 
a tune called New Girl. And uh, anyway, a lot of people like that. I was play I played a lot different than obviously. But actually, I was also playing in, in, um, oh God, I'm getting the name, the name, uh, the name of not popping up thing, you know, the great tenor player, uh, uh, um, had a, he had a big band for a while. Please, uh, Illinois Jacquette? No, 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 a modern guy, you know, you know shit. Joe Henderson, <laughs> trying to think of Joe Henderson. Joe Henderson had a band for a while, and I played in his band, and I picked up some shit from him, and it's kind of like, I knew a certain aspect of his playing I really liked, and it kind of filtered into what I was doing at that period. I think it, it kind of it comes out, a lot of people mention that on that a solo on that record. So that was, 19, I think, 1967, I think. Yeah, that was a, one of the uh, great Blue Note recordings of 67. You know, we've been talking a lot about big bands You uh, with Toshiko, your, your collaborator. Uh, you played at the Tonight Show band for a while. You mentioned uh, Duke Pearson, Joe Henderson. Uh, but lately, most of your performances seem to be with uh, a trio. Uh, could you compare in any way those two different formats? Yeah, I can compare them. It's, <laughs> I, I made that comment the other day to somebody. So it went from 16 to 3. You know, they didn't, they didn't get it. But uh, the point... I, I, I was never a big band player, as I mentioned, for some reason. I had some great experiences in big bands. Uh, people don't know. I, I was a member of the, uh, what was it, the uh, Cab Calloway um, reunion band, 1965 or 6, 66, I think it was. For some strange reason. I don't know how that happened, but I... It might have been a joke, but it was a great experience for me. I played next to some wonderful musicians, and I learned an awful lot. And I played in, you know, I had some really great big band experiences, but I also, my main thing, I always loved Sonny Rollins' trio playing, starting with uh, Live at the Village Vanguard. And then I heard him so many times in person, and the freedom that he had, and because he had you know, a big sound. He, he could just, he didn't have to worry about a microphone. He just walk around, play wherever he felt sounded best, or he was totally free. And I, I, I love that. And it gave you also the other side of it is responsibility of, of making a complete statement so that the audience knows that you're not just, uh, self-indulgent that we can actually play music have the feeling of the harmony evident and use all kinds of developmental uh, tools but anyway i love i love the responsibility of the trio because it you know if it fails it's probably mostly my fault but if it succeeds it's 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 all of us playing playing together it's a real communicant communicative situation. The less people have, the more communication. You have a big band, I mean, you, know, you play your part and you communicate on a different kind of level, but in a trio, when you're, you know, you really have to be really, really together. So I, I enjoy the challenge and I, you know, I, I, that's, that's basically what I like to do. Lately, I've added piano occasionally. Some, some venues I find piano makes it uh, more palatable for certain audiences or for or acoustical situation. Well, you've been working with a trio the past few years that's included uh, Boris Kovlov on bass and Mark Taylor on drums. We're going to look at a clip from a performance in January. Uh, Boris wasn't there. Peter Washington uh, was on bass. We're going to watch the trio play Sweet and Lovely. <laughs>
Yeah, some magic there. Lou Tobacco's trio recorded live at the Mexico Studios in January. We're coming to the end of the show here, and I got one final question for you, Mr. Tobacco. You've worked in a variety of settings with a variety of musicians over the years. Is there anyone you'd like to play with that you haven't been able to play with? Yeah, most of them are all, most of them are dead. I, I would say. <laughs> I don't know. That's a, that's. I have to think. I'm sure there are tons of them, but uh, I can't think about that. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm more concerned about the, <laughs> what the future will bring. You know, and uh, any anyway, I, I'm at a disadvantage. I couldn't hear what you. I, I don't hear what you're playing. You know. Okay. Uh, okay. We were so, playing uh, "Sweet and Lovely," uh, recorded live at your with your trio at Mexico Studios in January. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if it's any good or not, but <laughs> I'll have to take take your word for it if it's okay. But anyway, well, I don't. Know. It was I'm very gonna... good. You can take my word for it. Well, one final question here, because we come to the end of the show. So, gentleman uh, Henri de Lagarde uh, says, "Is there a statistical evidence that a more full-bodied saxophone sound is more likely that a trio or quartet can do without a piano?" Well, if, if I get the right question, I think it's what happens is when you, when you don't have a piano, you need to fill up space in a way sonically. So I don't think, uh, generally speaking, the trumpet trio is not, it doesn't work as quite as well. Or even, uh, someone mentioned that even an alto, it's just a tenor, is such a big sound that it covers a lot. It's, you know, it, uh, it seems to be a very natural thing for it to be you know, in a piano this setting. So if that, if that makes any sense, if that's what he's talking about. But I, I think it's true that tenor is a natural instrument to do with a piano this trio. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank my guest, Lou Tobacco, a man with a big sound and a big heart, who's brought, who brought us a lot of great music over the years. We'll look forward to more. We're going to go out uh, with a performance he did uh, with a group of New York All-Stars. On Friday, my guest will be Ted Pankin. Ted uh, is a respected journalist and uh, broadcaster. And we're going to uh, feature the music of Hank Jones, Phil Woods, and John Hicks. And uh, Ted's going to talk about uh, his experience with one of the great jazz clubs in jazz history back in New York called Bradley's. Thanks, anyone, thanks everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Lou Tobacken. Everyone, please stay healthy and happy. Same thing, I like to express my, uh, you know, uh, feelings and uh, hope everyone is safe, hangs in there, and uh, hope that the future uh, will be bright somehow. Yeah.
here.